Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, all. Uh, we are now starting our session Digital Humanities in this Latin Science workshop. I would like to say to you that uh, you might be witnessing a historic moment because, as far as I know, it's the first time a session on Digital Humanities is organized is organized for at the uh, Latin uh, Science Workshop. So we hope it is indeed the first time and we'll have opportunities to organize another sessions in uh, the next events. This session will have two panelists, Professor uh, Eduardo Marx, who is uh, 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 professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Sao Paulo, who uh, is going to be the first uh, to make uh, a presentation. Professor Eduardo Marques was also uh, uh, the uh, for a former director of the Center for Metropol Metropolitan Studies, which is one of the FAPESP's uh, CEPIDES. Uh, it's a center which has uh, a long experience in employing digital techniques to make research. And indeed, Professor uh, Eduardo Marques introduced these uh, techniques to make research at the center. So here he'll make uh, uh, his presentation. Uh, and uh, the next presentation will be Professor uh, Claudio uh, Pinanis. I will present him afterwards. Uh, each presentation will have 30 minutes, and then we'll open the discussion to the audience, okay? Professor Eduardo Marques. Okay. Ah, I don't have it here. I don't have it here. Okay, that's good. I just wanted to... Você consegue me colocar aqui também, não? Senão eu vou ter que ficar. Se não, tudo bem. Não, tudo bem. Tá bom. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, welcome you all. Um, as Marta said, my name is Eduardo Marques. I'm a, um, a professor at the Department of Political Science at USP. And uh, also a researcher at the Center for Metropolitan Studies. And uh, the presentation I'm going to, to make... Um, explore several of the, the, the studies and um, the, the uh, public policy oriented studies we did at the center in the last years. And um, so that's the idea. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, the, this presentation, I'm going to try to stick to the presentation because I, I, I I tend to speak too much, so mm -hmm. I'll try to stay on the presentation. Uh, this presentation focuses on the, the, the use of and the delivery of uh, geographical uh, database uh, for the social sciences, social and urban sciences in Brazil. Uh, and this is something relatively new, for the, especially for the public uh, coming from the States and from Europe. Uh, several of the uses I'm going to present here are relatively uh, common, but they are very uh, new uh, in the Brazilian case. So, uh, Some years ago, Brazilian lacked almost completely public access to uh, and dissemination of large databases, especially in geographical uh, format. Uh, but since the 90s, the situation has improved substantially with the free, um, free of charge provision of data from official agencies especially the National Bureau of uh, Statistics, but also uh, other agencies such as INPI, the National uh, Spatial Statistic, uh, Spatial uh, Research uh, Institute, 
but also uh, the actions of several research institutions such as my center, the Center for Mil Metropolitan Studies. Actually, these uh, centers of research had a very important um, role in pushing the, the official uh, agencies uh, for providing these kinds of services. They didn't do this. I'm going to uh, give you some examples of this later on. Uh, well, this produced an important momentum on the understanding of social phenomena at academic circles, but also contributed to the public sector, providing support for decision-making uh, processes. What kinds of uses uh, have been made of quantitative and geographical analysis for urban and social phenomena? This presentation uh, shows some examples of, this, of these uh, developments, and I'm stopping with words, and I'm s uh, sticking with images from this point on. Okay. So uh, I'm going to present a lot of uh, examples of things we have been doing and discuss this uh, while presenting. So we have been mapping social indicators and uh, finding detailed uh, segregation patterns. S this was something that was not possible in Brazil ten, 10, 15 years or 20 years ago, since we didn't have uh, census tracts uh, uh, databases available. Uh, the, the, the National uh, Bureau of Statistics didn't deliver this, uh, these uh, databases, and uh, you could buy some of, uh, depending on the city, you could, could buy census tract da uh, databases, geographical databases, but for, uh, say, 15,000 or 20,000 uh, dollars, uh, uh, the database, okay? And uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, 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 use may uh, provide a very, very finely gra granted, detailed uh, analysis of the, s the, 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 the spaces of the cities. Uh, we can also map segregation by, so by social groups uh, using uh, geographical information uh, analysis. Uh, this is a, a simple map of the distribution of high-grade professionals, but uh, uh, to, to, to build this, there's a lot of statistics on the, 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 uh, the, the census data to construct social classes considering one of the most important social stratification classifications, which is this AGP, uh, which is th the name of the guys who uh, created the, the classification. And uh, with this kind of, uh, this kind of, of, of uh, data, we can analyze uh, social classes in Brazil in a much more detailed and, uh, uh, and precise way than uh, the literature on social sciences and urban studies did uh, until the 90s. Okay. Uh, and we, we, we can also map this and analyze the, the, the spatial patterns. For example, this is, uh, these two, two uh, maps are both for the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo. The first one is high-grade professionals, which, which is the top of the, the, the occupational structure. And the second one is the skilled manual workers, which is the for this labor force, okay? And the darker, the 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 higher the percentage of the group, as you can see, the two maps are one a mirror of the other. Okay, so you have a very very strong segregation pattern, but also an avoidance kind of pattern in space, and this uh, becomes very uh, easy to 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 grasp uh, looking at the maps. We can also analyze spatial growth. This is a map of uh, slums in São Paulo. In, in a small uh, part of Sao Paulo in the, the, the eastern zone, uh, comparing or superposing 1991 and 2000 perimeters for favelas. Okay? So you can analyze uh, spatial growth using these kinds of, of, of analysis. And you can also discuss difficult differences, um, concepts, concepts and definitions of urban phenomena. Uh, uh, this, in this case, uh, the, the, the similar uh, kind of uh, thing, favelas also, but favelas in two different senses. Favelas according to IBGE data on 2000 and on 2010, but also uh, favelas according to the municipality of Sao Paulo. And the, the, there's a, a difference uh, between, uh, between these three uh, uh, information 
uh, in what concerns uh, the, the limits, obviously. So you have an, in red the, the favelas according to IBGE in 2010, in green favelas in 2000 according to IBGE, and in gray uh, favelas according to the municipality of Sao Paulo. Uh, you have all the possibilities. You have, the, all the, you have favelas who continue to, to be favelas, favelas who were not favelas and became favelas, and places which were considered favelas and are not anymore, and favelas in, according to the municipality with different superpositions with the, the IBGE. So the, 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 the hope, it's not uh, GIS techniques and statistical techniques uh, used in the social sciences here are not only to present data, but also to try to understand what these data are about. We can also compare growth patterns. Uh, this is, a, again, the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo. Uh, in the, the left-hand side, you have the, the, the growth uh, in the, the, the 1990 decade, and this in, in the 2000 years. Uh, reds are areas which had negative growth in the decade. Uh, light blue are areas with very small uh, growth, and uh, dark blue are areas with uh, high uh, growth rates. Okay? As you can see, uh, during the, the, the 90s, you had a very clear pattern, uh, center-periphery pattern, uh, of uh, decrease, populational decrease of the center of the city of the metropolitan region, and uh, once you go to the peripheries, you get more growth. Okay? And this pattern is completely different here in during the, the, the next decade. So uh, there's a, 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 an important discussion now in the public policies in Sao Paulo about, uh, there was a, a very important discussion about this pattern and how this area, which was the, the area which had more infrastructure and good living conditions, was decreasing populationally. And the, the, the outskirts of the city, which had no infrastructure, was, were increasing a lot. But uh, you have a lot of discussions now to try to understand what caused this uh, very, s very strong uh, change in the, the, in the decade. And we can do this uh, just looking at the maps and analyzing the maps and comparing the maps visually, or we can do this in a more hard way uh, using spatial statistics. Uh, this is the, the, these are the, the two, um, the two um, modern index uh, graphs for spatial statistics for each of the maps, the previous maps. Okay, sorry. Uh, this, this map here is associated with this, with this graph here and the, the other way around with the other one. And what's this uh, spatial statistic thing? It's very e easy to understand. Spatial statistics, oh, uh, Mora maps are, Mora uh, statistics are statistics that compare a variable of one uh, geographical unit with uh, the, the average value of this same variable uh, in the surrounding areas, in the neighbors of, those, uh, of that place. So it's, uh, it's a measure of uh, spatial autocorrelation, okay? So, uh, in the, it, so the, it, the, in the, these, uh, in this information may be graphed, so here you have the, 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 the growth rate of one single uh, area and the growth rate, the average growth rate of the, the, uh, the, the neighbors. In this case, the, 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 the growth rate of the area is much higher than the growth rate of the neighbors. Okay? Uh, and uh, after mapping the, and uh, after graphing all the, the information, you can uh, uh, cr create a, a re regression line, and with this regression line, you can compare quantitatively the two patterns. Okay? And uh, as you can see, there's a, a significant drop in the, in the correlation between areas and uh, their neighbors in the decade. And this is also... Uh, 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 it's also possible to see this in the slope of the two lines. We can also map uh, social structure in space and discuss the changes of, this, uh, of, of the patterns. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a map of the, the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo in 2000, 2010, and these are spaces considering profiles of social classes. Uh, the, the other maps I, I've showed uh, uh, were maps uh, thematic maps of one single 
uh, category, the presence of high, uh, high grade professionals. But even in the places where high, high grade professionals are very present, they are 30% of the whole population which is there. And you have 70% which belongs to different social classes. So you can analyze this with uh, factor analysis, analysis and uh, cluster analysis to try to um, discriminate profiles of social classes uh, in spaces and create uh, classification of spaces. So space of the elite, space of the middle classes, high middle classes, space of the manual workers and so on and so forth. And analyzing and comparing the maps and comparing uh, s in spatial statistics the kind of uh, uh, analysis I have showed uh, before you can um, an, uh, analyze the changes on s in social structure also. This is what is done here. Uh, here you have, uh, you can investigate uh, segregation patterns using indexes, Moran statistics and another uh, 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 s uh, segregation index, dissimilarity index, and try to compare, try to analyze which group is more or uh, more in or less segregation uh, segregated and which group is getting more segregated or not but uh, after uh, saying all this we can just try to analyze uh, uh, distribute events and analyze uh, uh, spatial patterns I, I like very much this uh, this map um, this is a map that uh, presents the the um, the recently born uh, children per, per, per the address of the mothers, uh, filtering by mothers, teenage mothers, okay? Uh, and, uh, and each of these, these things is a dot, is a case, and the, the, the map presents all the cases from 2000 to 2005, pooled, and um, I don't know if, you, if the persons from, from outside Sao Paulo can see this clearly, but we don't have the limits of the city. This is the municipality of Sao Paulo. It, this is it, yeah, the, the points, the cases themselves, create a perfect map of the boundaries of the city, of the municipality of Sao Paulo, without the boundaries, because the, 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 the pattern of uh, distribution of the cases is so peripheral that they, they d uh, draw the boundaries of the city. And we can do a lot of, uh, we can try to use this, uh, this information, these, these informations to the public sector, to help the public sector do better policies. And uh, now I'm going to present a series of uh, slides with uh, results of studies the Center for Metropolitan Studies did for uh, public agencies. This is a uh, part of a, a large uh, study we did to, to the uh, Ministry of Cities, uh, uh, which uh, aimed at uh, uh, producing, creating a methodology to estimate and map uh, precarious settlements in 576 uh, 76 municipalities with the production of maps for 517 municipalities. Okay. And uh, this is uh, this the metropolitan region of Belém, uh, which is in the north of the country, uh, near the, the Amazon uh, forest. Uh, and uh, in red, you have the, 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 the census tracts, which the, the IBGE, the, f uh, the official agency, uh, statistical agency, uh, said they were favelas. And uh, now, and the, the yellow ones are the ones which we found uh, there are similar uh, completely uh, similar to the ones that IBGE classified and should be considered favelas if uh, IBGE changed I its classification. We can also uh, study access to public services and to equipments. Uh, this is uh, part of a, uh, of a study we did to, to the municipality of Sao Paulo some years ago. Uh, it's in the north, uh, in, the, in the east zone of the city. Um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, we did a seri series of uh, studies uh, using spatial uh, analysis and spatial statistics and statistics to, uh, of social indicators uh, to um, try to analyze uh, spatial mismatch between, between uh, equipments and the demand for services. Uh, in this case, uh, schools. So uh, in red, uh, in, in blue, you have the uh, e each dot is a school, 
and uh, the, the small squares, are, small areas are the census tracts, and uh, considering the, the distance of the, the census tract to the nearest school, the, the centroid of the uh, census tract, you, you can uh, find places, regions where, for example, here or here or here, where new equipment could be built. And this can be uh, uh, sophisticated uh, by uh, different uh, level of school, uh, of education, and so on and so forth. This is another, another um, study we did uh, tr uh, comparing slums with several health uh, situations. In this case, the dots are pneumonia cases of persons who were, um, uh, who became, uh, who went hosp hospitalized with pneumonia and uh, the small, um, the, I don't know what's the color of this, green uh, census tracts are favelas. So uh, there are, uh, although there, there's a, a general pattern of distribution of this, uh, there, there are uh, s specific clusters of uh, pneumonia cases near favelas, and this can be uh, studied uh, in deep. And uh, we can also uh, uh, analyze the, the distribution of votes and try to uh, see if uh, there, there are patterns of uh, electoral, uh, electoral uh, dynamics going on and how this, uh, in, and try to analyze if they, these patterns of the uh, distribution of votes are associated with uh, social conditions or with social classes or uh, and, and analyze uh, electoral behavior. This, this is the municipality of Sao Paulo. Uh, again, with the votes for two uh, local councillors in uh, one specific election. The red is more votes, the, the yellow is less votes, so in this case you, the, the, the representative has a very peripheral pattern of distribution and in this case very centered in the richer area of the city. What do we need to, for doing all this? GIS softwares and statistical packages with statistical analysis, which does, uh, uh, which uh, can uh, include uh, statistical, spatial statistics tools. Uh, we have been uh, uh, saying has worked um, towards this um, this goal. Uh, we have uh, we have a, a partnership with INPI, with uh, the National Spatial uh, uh, Agency, Brazilian Agency. And um, they had uh, a GIS software, freeware software called TerraView, and this, uh, but this, uh, there's a very good, uh, it's a very good uh, GIS software, but uh, it's quite compli complicated, and uh, it lacked several very simple, quite simple sometimes uh, uh, tools to to do things, and uh, at the same time, it had a lot of uh, things which were too sophisticated for the common user. So uh, we, we uh, had a, have a partnership with them and we um, uh, customized the TerraView program for local uh, policymakers. So the, there's a, a new version of TerraView which, which, which is called TerraView uh, Politica Sociais, Social Policies, which is uh, software uh, which we understand is much better for the, 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 the average user of a municipal service. Uh, and we have also, and this uh, this stati this uh, software includes a sev several st uh, tools for for spatial statistics. We have, uh, but providing the, the 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 software is not everything. We have to uh, give trainment to people. So, uh, saying has the Center for Metropolitan Studies has a, a line of courses, which are. Um, depending on the, the, the user, uh, or the student, paid or not, depending on uh, the, the association uh, the, the public agency has with saying. And we have been training uh, hundreds of, I, 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 I think, uh, probably around a thousand uh, technicians uh, in the last eight years uh, using, f to use, first to use a, uh, um, uh, commercial uh, software, but once we had TerraView customized, we uh, started to use TerraView in the courses. And we have, have to have GIS, GIS databases, which are provided by several 
institutions uh, such as uh, IBGE, SEM, uh, and INPE. IBGE, it, now the, the National uh, Bureau of Statistics, Brazilian Bureau of Statistics, is providing a lot of uh, databases uh, in GIS format. But they are still, they still have a lot of problems and they have to be worked uh, very intensely uh, before becoming uh, operational. Uh, this was not like this in, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we didn't have any database for this. So you had to go to the market. And sometimes, depending on the agency, you had to go to the market to buy the, data, the public database in the private market. Okay? Uh, we had the, uh, the, 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 addressable, uh, the addressable street map for the municipality of Sao Paulo, which is absolutely essential to um, to localize uh, uh, this, uh, to, to do, actually this also, to do this kind of exercise which is associated to, to addresses, but also with this, also to addresses, and this also addresses, all of them um, were impossible without a, a, an addressable uh, map of the city, and the, 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 the municipality of Sao Paulo had a map until and until 2004, 2005 maybe, the, the map was not delivered, uh, nor uh, the, the municipality simply didn't allow anybody to get the, the map, but the database was available, this ex exactly database was available in the private market for 30,000 reais or 15,000 dollars. So one of the things which is very, very, uh, very important to, to this kind of uh, use uh, in Brazil recently is that um, the databases became much more available because they, uh, several uh, institutions be, uh, started to provide the databases for free. Okay? And uh, I think the Center for Metropolitan Studies has uh, a role on this, pressuring to, to break this monopoly the monopoly of, of, of uh, uh, databases. But the BGE now is doing a, a, a good job, quite it's getting better to provide databases for free. Okay. That's it. So uh, thank you, Professor. Professor Eduardo Marques for such an interesting presentation and for making it on time. Our next presentation presenter will be Professor uh, Claudio Pignanes. He was also a professor at USP and got his uh, PhD on computer science at MIT. He has been working at IBM for almost 15 years and five of them uh, in Brazil. Am I right? So, please. Okay. Right. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, as Professor Marta said, uh, I work at, uh, today at IBM Research Brazil. I'm, uh, I lead a, a group. I'm going to talk a little about that. And uh, been before I was at USP, today I was seeing some of my ex-students as professors here. It's always fun, uh, especially when they cheated on, on the exams. But uh, the after that, I went to MIT. Then, I, for 10 years, I was at our big lab in, in New York City, in, close to New York City, and now I'm here in Brazil. And uh, uh, just how many of you knew before I said that IBM had a, has a reasonably big lab in Brazil? OK, so I, so I can really talk about So this is the view from our lab. It's not bad. Well, this is one of the sites of our lab. <laughs> this is at uh, uh, the back of our, this is a IBM building in Rio. The back of it is uh, the Urca. So it's a very nice location. But 
we didn't set up a lab here to, because of the view. I mean, we, in fact, we set up a lab in Brazil because of the talent we, had, we, th we thought we had here and the talent we are finding here. <coughs> uh, but our goal is, I mean, is be one of the labs of the IBM Research Organization. IBM Research has 3,000 researchers in 12 labs over the world. Uh, our goal is to be about 100, 100 something in two years. We are about 60 uh, people right now. We are started two years ago. It's not a, a bad ramp up. Uh, and in fact, we have two sites, one in Sao Paulo, another in Rio, about half and half of the, of the researchers. And we decided to focus in four areas in Brazil. Okay, each lab of IBM tends to focus on different areas. And here in Brazil we have a, a large group in, in natural resources, oil, gas, uh, water issues. We have a group that focus, that's called the Smarter Human System, that focuses on social development, it's doing a project on accessibility, for example. Uh, we have my group who works in, in service, I'm going to talk a little more. And I have a group who does uh, microelectronics, uh, especially uh, packaging of, 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 of micro devices, and that's in Rio. So, uh, one important thing is IBM discriminates between research and development. So, we are not an R&D organization, we are an R organization. So our focus is to do science, but also to bring science to our business, but not as a development organization, which IBM has a lot more people than research. What uh, do I call, uh, what service systems research? Basically, uh, what my group is interested in is in looking into, uh, res into service systems that are very dependent on information and try to reinvent and create new technologies for those systems. Things like banking, uh, retail, education, telecom, uh, media entertainment. Those are information-based services, and that's the kind of technologies we are trying to uh, address in terms of needs. Uh, we have a very multidisciplinary group, and that's essential to work in this area, and we focus in four main areas of this space. One is in computing service platforms, the other is uh, service delivery, IT services, Another one that does uh, social business analytics. I'm going to talk in depth about a project uh, on that area. And also you're interested in how we improve client experience uh, in terms of uh, the service context. One important question is, why do you want to do service research in Brazil? And uh, with and, and the way I see this is, this, we are in a very special moment in the world, very unique. There's a, a big transformation in our view going on, and we are not talking about the climate change. That's the other one. What, what we think is important, especially in this context, is that in the next 20, 10, 20 years, more than half of the world is going to become middle class. And this is absolutely new in terms of social context. So, uh, of course, I have to say, oh, how do you define middle class? Let's think this way, disposable income. I mean, you have work, I mean, before people have money enough just to live, or less than money enough to live. Now we have more and more people getting to the point that they have disposable income. And uh, it's interesting, where, where, is, where is going to be this middle class? And the question is simple, China and India. See the graph here, uh, the, the bottom curve there, let me see if I, oops. Yeah. This is uh, India, right? Yes, no. This is China, and this is India. No, no, wait, 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 wait. It's hard. Yeah, okay. This is the word. This is the word except China and India. Okay, that's the answer. Okay, and a little of this is Brazil, in fact. 
And uh, it's also where all the consumption is going to be. So this, in 30 years, we expect half of, half, more than half of the consumption of the world will be of, in terms of middle class China and India. It's a huge transformation. And uh, interesting enough, the question is, what's the impact of this? So we think that's one, that there's this collection of problems related to this growth, to this increasing disposable income. That will be the key challenges that we have to face besides the climate change. And although related to that. And it's like, how can we produce energy without carbon, without producing carbon? Because there's going to be a huge spike driven by this cloud. And water and food, and we have to, ha to learn how to make products in a more sustainable way, otherwise we'll run out of resources. But very important, when people become middle class, they increase their demand for services. And uh, service productivity is the thing that hasn't grown in the last 20 years. So I'm, uh, I'm, the answer to that question in many ways is related to the fact that this is a key problem to address. How can we make service, banking, retail, education, health, all this uh, service that people need more productive and with better quality. And uh, so I want to talk a little more about this. And, uh, but first say, why Brazil? Well, the issue is, in Brazil we crossed that line four years ago. I'm not sure you were aware of that. I was surprised when I heard. So more than, of course it depends how you define middle class. But th there's a trend here. If it was five, four, two, it doesn't matter. And we think that Brazil is the place where we have read the, the framework, the, the need for new services for this class. So we can use Brazil as a test bed for these new kinds of services that have to be developed, the new ways of doing service. And also because this middle class is not exactly what we expect. What we know from studying this middle class is that that middle class is not the 1950s American middle class in the 21st century. It's not the Jetsons, which is exactly that portrayal. No. One thing we learn about this middle class is they don't want to become Americans or Italians, which is normally what middle class wanted to be in Brazil. They want to become something different, which are more like Brazilians with disposable income. And, uh, but one thing we learn is they don't tolerate bad service quality. So our challenge is to produce service at quality and scale. Because this is half of the population. And quality, I mean, if you interview the new middle class, they are as intolerant to queues in supermarket as the A class in Brazil. They don't, they don't buy into this thing of, I can tolerate worse service for less money. And the problem is when you look at the old technologies that we developed for the 1950s middle, middle class and beyond, was either about quality or scale. So the supermarket was our solution, our scale solution, but not our call it something. It was a way to, to, to deal with the mass uh, movement of goods into households from the small stores that existed before. And again, when you look into quality, we say, oh, just put more people. Let's put 20 students per class. That's, oh, that's great quality. Does that scale? No. How many millions and millions of professors I would need in China and India if I use the 20 to 1 rule? Do I have ways to produce enough of these teachers? Do I know how to graduate millions from university? So that's the kind. So the real challenge is how to do the both things. And we, the way we see is we have to rethink how we deliver and how we do services. And uh, so and, that, and there's a, a large important part to be played by 
uh, computer science, and social science. But in many ways, though, I'm sticking to my main area of work, which is computer science. These are areas that computer science can really help this new service. One is finding better ways to use social analytics. I'm going to talk more about that. The other is find ways to remove people from front and back offices, automate things. The other is make, whenever I have humans interacting, provide the service, make them more effective and having technologies to, to make that more effective. Another is find ways to deal with infrastructures of these countries which are tend, to, tend and will be still very poor in the next 20 years, very complicated. And then there is a very important thing is make services into products. So we say, make robo robotics and devices. I mean, the simplest case of that is, in the past I used to go to a pharmacy to get my uh, blood pressure. Now I buy a small device, I go at home and measure it. For most needs, it's as good. In terms of quality, it's as good as the pharmaceutical guy, assistant, blah, 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 who barely could do pressure anyway. So. I'm not, uh, I don't have time today to talk, really talk about automation for office, but it's a huge area. It's a huge, huge area. And we have seen the first guys doing this, but they are doing the easy service, it's commerce. Commerce is a very easy service. Hard, they don't, uh, talk, I mean, we have to talk about health, education. Those are difficult things. But this is a good start. It's also, there's a huge space for robotics at home. And then the Japanese are ahead in that area. They are really thinking. And uh, so you see here, I mean, this is an ice cream serving machine. This is a surgery. Sometimes it's an initial precision. Here's a messenger. Here's a, a machine to help uh, paraplegic people eat. And this is a robotic cleaner. You can buy one of those. And then I challenge you to say, what is this machine for? Any idea? The, the, the one, the, oops, sorry. This one here. Okay, here. The bottom middle. Any suggestion? Okay. Cleaning toilets. Goes rear end, cleans it. It's Japanese, come on. Have to. Anim had a profound cultural influence in Japan, and we have to to take that. So, but of course there's a huge explosion and that's what I'm going to give you a concrete example of research we are doing in Brazil in, mid, in data about people in a level that we never had before. So for the first time I think we can actually do quantitative social analysis in, at large scale. I mean because this data is sitting all over this place. We cannot do now because these people are defending this data like crazy too well, so it's hard. But the potential is there. And we have to find ways to connect everyone and find ways to mine all this information because then we can start to think about how can we predict better the behavior of people? How can we understand what's happening with the population so we can respond, for instance, by preparing health services to what's happening and things like that. So what we are doing is uh, looking at this problem and trying to develop uh, probabilistic models of this behavior, so we can predict and analyze. Just so I understand, how many people here has a, have a computer science uh, data analysis background? Okay, half. Okay. Okay, so, so there may be too many equations for some of you, and too few for some of you, but maybe I think it will work out. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a project we started last. Uh, end of last year, uh, middle, and almost middle of last year, of a simulation of social media. And this is an effort of a, a lot of people. We have experts of different areas. We have an expert in simulation. We have experts in text analytics. Uh, we have um, Samuel, who's there, who's working with us, and uh, a lot of people. And what's, what we are trying to do? Uh, when we think about, think about Twitter, it's a simple example of social media, Twitter. So what companies are doing now basically is trying to first to listen what's going on. 
which is already a lot of work, to properly listen to understand what people are chatting about. But, and this is normally the first stage is monitoring, looking what sort of, but then there's the power of analyzing it, of really making the kind of conclusions that, that Eduardo was talking. But we see, we, we see this for, for many activities that, you, that a company or organization wants to do in this space. There's also a need to plan those kind of campaigns. And there's a little problem with the social media explains, uh, example. It is viral. Means it, it, it's, hard, it's very hard to understand how fast information will propagate there because of the way it's connected in the way the information flows. So we had a recently an example of an airline company in Brazil which decided to do the Black Friday kind of um, uh, promotion and said, oh, I mean, tickets would cost whatever. And uh, they were expected did this viral campaign, they expect, I think, 50,000 people around that. Two million people showed their website. It went too much viral. Well, the website crashed, and uh, I don't think, I don't have the numbers, but probably half of the people actually managed to get a promotion. Anyway, they started, they got maybe 30,000 people happy, 1,970,000 happy. Why? Because they couldn't plan the campaign. And it's hard, because it's viral. Okay, so what we are trying to do is to model those systems, to model the propagation. And, with this, and, and, and we are looking into this in a very practical way. How can I use this medium in the best way possible? How can I anticipate what's going to happen? How can I, in the case of a campaign, how can I predict what's my return on this? I mean, we, work, we sell technology for companies. That's the kind of question they ask. But right now, it's very hard to get any of these answers. And what we are, our approach, we, and this is a very initial technology. I mean, this is a project that still have one year or more to go. Okay, I'm going to show you the base first results. But our idea is we, are going, we sample the network, we, and then we, we sample the, what they are talking and the network structure. Then we do sentiment analysis and topic analysis of, of, of what they are talking. Then we do predictive modeling of user behavior. When you receive a message of topic Y, what you do? You retweet, you post another thing, you, set, you send a message saying not Y, all this kind of behavior. And, we, and to make this happen, because complex, we do uh, agent-based simulation of this. Let me tell you, so this is the, the, the method, it's basically what I just said. So just let me relate to this, what, what our people are doing. So there is, some people in research who are building very interesting models of what the nodes do, but they don't look at the whole network, the whole predictive modeling of, what's of the behavior. And there's a lot of people who are doing modeling of the network and how it propagates information, but don't do a good job of modeling how different is the behavior of each node. Normally, they assume all nodes work in the same way. And we think the reality is a mix of those. And especially in social media, where people become followers of other people, not necessarily because they agree or they like that person. I mean, and this will be clear in the example we did. So what we did for sample, we, this was around uh, September last year. So we decided to sample. Uh, to understand what is happening with the American elections. And with, so this, we took a sample from the last month of the Obama-Romney campaign. Okay? And this is the job of someone who is out there. He's a PG student of Robert. So what we did is, I mean, we take the Obama network, 20 million followers. And if you take one more level of this network, you have the whole Twitter. Basically, okay? Everyone's a friend of a friend of Obama, of a follower of a follower of Obama. Friend, no, it's another thing. So we did a sample. Uh, we, and then we took a sample of the tweets that these people talked. And the we had about 5 million, 6 million tweets in one month, which is a good sample. 
Of this, most of that don't talk about Obama or Romney. They talk about other stuff. In the end, we had about 25,000 email uh, tweets about Obama or Romney. Of all this, I believe there's about uh, this 25,000 users. Okay. Uh, so we did an, a, a, a same analysis using sort of standard techniques. To say what they are talking about Obama or uh, first about Obama or Romney, and second positive or negative. And uh, so here is sort of how it looks like. So this is one month, okay? And uh, in purple you have uh, the messages, the, flow, the number of messages. Here, this, the other ones. Not Obama, not Romney. So basically it's interesting. This is Sunday, no, this, each, each block this is a day. And because the US, most of this is in the US, so you have during the day, people talk. There is a little peak in the evening. People talk more and tweet in the evening. And the Saturday, Sunday, who cares for tweeting? Except when it closes to football time and then people start peaking again. Okay? And, everything, and uh, this is what people, uh, when, what they talk about Obama. If, if we remove the, the other. So this is the different... Uh, uh, this message is according to being positive, negative for Obama, positive, negative for Romney. Normally, Obama positive dominates, but there are peaks where Romney positive dominates. Also. Okay. Uh, when you look at the messages, the political messages that people sent, it's very interesting this pattern. So most of the time, it's positive about Obama. I think there's this huge four peaks here. Which are those four peaks? An idea. During the last month of campaign. Debates. The three debates and the, the vice presidential debate. And it's interesting, when during the debates, Romney negative dominates. People talk bad about Romney more than anything else during the debates. So we did this. So we have now our data. Now, can we model this? So what we developed was uh, a basic Markov chain model of each node of the network. So every node has its individual model, which is calibrated according to what that node did during that month, based on basically saying things like, if you received a positive message, what's the probability that it sent a positive message about Obama, and so on. Very basic model, very initial. We're still working to improve this. And uh, so we did this, uh, the classical structure to way to do, do this, this behavior model, this probabilistic behavior modeling. I'm not going to enter in details here. But also we had to model not only what they say, but how much they talk. And that because we saw that variation in, 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 in behavior through time. And we did this mo module as a mix of uh, uh, transition, the period of the day, and uh, the, the fact that Sunday and, 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 um, and, and Saturday they have smaller, uh, people are busy doing other stuff besides tweeting. So then we put this in a simulation model. So we, we take it at each step, we take each agent, we, we take a random probability that determines what's the next step, if that, person, if that node's going to post a tweet, or not, and so on. And uh, to validate what we compute is the distance between what we predict for each topic, for each sentiment, for the vo total volume, and the actual number during the, that month, and take the square of that, and the sum for all points. And this is what you're doing here. So, but since there's a lot of variation of volume, we have to basically normalize this. So we are basically completing what's the distance between the two curves. And that's the simplest way to see this. Okay? So here is here is the actual curve for one week. And here where we are. We are getting there. Okay? And uh, at some point we have to 
It was not working well, and then we realized the issue was that the U.S. covers four time zones. So the night, in fact, is a little shorter than you expect. So we have to remove that, and then the, the system improved. Still worth to do. But this is a, sort of how we, the, the actual error. So imagine that we should be here in the bottom, if you're perfect. And, we, and you see that the short night improved. This point here is just the ramp up phase of the model. That's uh, normal. But let's look what happens when you look at topic and sentiment of this network. So uh, the error is, the worst error is in fact raw and negative, and that's, the, the, uh, that's due to the fact that uh, uh, this, the sample is, if I remember, the sample is large, but it's, it's not a pattern easy to, to the, the, the probabilities, the local probabilities are not good. Uh, but let me show, to finish, and I think we, about time, show you a little example of what kind of analysis we can make with this kind of simulator. Because so far I was trying to match the data. Well, sort of success, not much. Good progress. But we are interested to say, uh, let's look at the issue of engagement. How important are people who are, people that in organizations who are very engaged in a process? And engagement we define as uh, how much a node reacts to what it receives, what, which is reading and propagates or, or act in response, okay? And in particular, we are interested in what happens if Obama or Roman said, I'm not going to use tweet anymore. Forget it. But also in the second, le in the next level, say, what if the most engaged guys stop doing? Okay? Again, this is a sample. Uh, there are some errors here, but it's more an a type of analysis. So let's look at all topics, okay? Uh, all the traffic. So what we expect is, again, here's the, ideally, if it were perfect, if there was no change, we would be here. So if we remove Obama, it's the not much. It's there is change, but not much. If you remove the top ten engaged guys that follow him. It's here. Uh, it gets a little worse, the simulation. You remove important guys, it gets worse. If you remove the top 100 engaged guys, then it gets start to get a lot worse. So these guys are important. But if you just remove 100 randomly, not, in, not considered engaged, you see that the, the effect is less than removing the really engaged guys. So that means also we say, this, we're saying this, it's also sh so shows the simulation seems to be working. It's matching our notion. But what's interesting, when we look not at all topics, but people talking about Obama. And again, removing Obama is here. Is Obama has more influence than the first, the top ten engaged guy following him. This is interesting. So that shows that the, the three or four key sites that follow you have less importance in, in changing the system than the, the center of the network. If this is analysis right. Oops, sorry. I'm finishing this. Uh, so it's also, and then if you move uh, the top 100 again, it's, you have a, a lot of impact, which is more than, uh, than random 100. So this is the kind of thing you can start doing. Basically, uh, the question here is, could be summarized is, is worth doing marketing social media? And we are not ready to answer this uh, question. But that's the kind of analysis you can start to doing with this kind of tool, because you can simulate it under conditions that we are never going to see in the real world. Okay? So to finish, we still have a lot of stuff to do. I mean, in each of the, the PCs and the whole, but I, we think it's a very important way to try to understand the system. And this is the kind of research we are trying to do in this space. I just want to finish one, with one more comment, uh, which is, I think this area of data analytics and uh, social data analytics is really important, is really thinking about. But we have an incredible shortage of people who can actually work with that data. I think 
I, I think it's a very important time, and this is the right forum to talk about this, but for, to find uh, university programs that may be multi-department multi that look at how can we create data scientists in the volume that big data will require. Big data will require a lot of data science to f look at it, and we don't have those people. We don't have them. Okay, people who understand statistics, who understand data mining, who understand enough computer, computation not proposed, exponential search to that space, and also co people who can bring this, all these conclusions back to home and to the uh, social, uh, and to compare with the social truth, let's put it, with the ground truth of, of this phenomenon. I think it's, it's very important to, to look into this kind of, of, of people. Okay, thank you. And Thank you, Professor Claudio Pianis, for such a fascinating presentation. So now we have time for the audience to make questions, comments. Yeah, so, uh, please, please. Sure. Can everybody hear Claudia? Is it okay or no, I okay? Yeah, okay. I, I may need a microphone okay. because I don't know whether it's being taped or not. It is. It is. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So I was wondering um, because Eduardo's uh, presentation was mostly geocentered, and yours was at the end. Of course, you covered lots of uh, of subjects, but uh, yours at the end was uh, tweet centered. Uh, how can you combine both approaches so that you have a geo-Twitter-centered uh, uh, analysis? It would probably show you uh, distinct trends and, uh, and it would uh, refine your, both of yours uh, analysis. Can both of you guys comment on, on, on combining these sources of data? One issue is are we on? Yeah, is that not all tweets have geographical information. The, not all tweet, tweets have geographical information where they were sent from. Okay, it's because you have to enable that explicitly in in Twitter, and also you have to be in a device using a device that has GPS or some other. Position. So, but some are, and I've seen people doing this kind of analysis. We haven't done, but I, I've seen it. It's very interesting, uh, the kind of data that, that you can get. Uh, I don't know about Twitter exactly, but, uh, but this is one of the frontiers of, uh, of the social sciences which uh, work with uh, social network analysis in a broader sense, which is to combine mapping of relations with the mapping of the territory or to superpose the two things. Uh, this is my, ex uh, uh, it's a coincidence because this is exactly my field. This is what, what I do, is connect segre spatial segregation and uh, social networks. Try to analyze uh, the, the role of space and connections and different patterns of uh, relations in um, social phenomena. And, uh, but this is uh, really, a it's, it's an interesting topic, and uh, it's in the frontier. Maybe just say one more thing. Is, uh, uh, mobile phone companies have that kind of data. I mean, uh, if, you combine, if you have access to SMS, and then you know the closest station that they w w where they are sent from. So, and that's incredibly, and also they, you know who they are talking to. It's, I mean, telecom companies have the best database about people relationship. Uh, I mean, it's really impressive also because it's very pervasive to society. Mm -hmm. So they're in an incredible good position in, in this space if they learn how to do data analysis. Uh, with the small n, while we don't have this big n uh, data, what we do is to ask people about uh, their relations and their locations 
where they live, where the, they and try to analyze and study specific studies uh, for specific social groups. Uh, what's uh, how the superposition of the two uh, patterns of networks uh, happens? So it's great to hear the talks. Uh, I think the social media is very helpful or meaningful today in understanding s social topics, social science. But if you want to extend this to natural science, um, how do you get the truth out of comments, right? Rumors tend to spread, and people tend to make extreme comments when they spread, spread them in social media. So any thoughts on how to distill objective information from uh, these tweets and, and things like that? Well, uh, I would uh, rephrase uh, the, the subject as the, the problem of uh, connecti uh, cognitive data. So uh, how to work with cognitive data, data that pass through the cognition of the, 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 the person who answers or who tweets or who answers the phone and everything. And uh, because uh, uh, there's no truth or no lie in this thing. People behave uh, considering the, 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 the information that they have and the way they process the information. So if someone represents uh, reality in his head, for example, my, my data on, uh, I, I just uh, finished a large uh, research on um, the role of social networks and segregation on uh, poverty in Brazil. Uh, with a very tiny, for your standards, sample of uh, 362 persons, personal networks, and uh, uh, not only ego-centered networks, but uh, personal networks, and uh, it was very hard to get this small sample because you have to stay there several times interviewing people and everything. And uh, this, uh, so w this was, uh, this, uh, your question, passed through my mind when I was starting the, the, the research and f I, I get completely convinced that people use the networks they understand. So there's no network hidden in one specific place which is the true network. The, the network is the network which is associated to the, the actions of the persons and the actions of the persons are associated with the cognition they have. So uh, I think through cognitive data, we we get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, of, of the, the information exactly the, the kind of information we need. We have to filter for for lies specifically, uh, but uh, depending on the situation, you don't have to do. It's not logic to think that the person is lying. So the person is not is just thinking the the world with its own head. So let me, let me give you an example of uh, things we, we uh, saw in research. For example, we look at people checking data right, on Facebook and so on. And people tend to check in in high-end restaurants and places like that, although you couldn't expect these people to go to those kind of places every day. If you just look at that particular aspect of what got exposed in social network, you get a biased view on uh, the living standard of these people, for example. Okay. Uh. I just uh, just to compliment on a totally different uh, uh, subject, but it's about the same thing. Uh, bird watchers, okay, and there's lots of citizen science which is built on bird watchers reports, and it's been. S uh, kind of recently discovered that lots of bird watchers lie their sightings because they want to get, I don't know, a bonus marks for seeing rare birds where they don't exist. So you create a completely uh, false view and then they start tweeting each other about uh, the bird they, they saw which does not exist. And then you build a database of observations of birds b built on that. But if your subject is about prestige and the, the, the how people try to find uh, status in a specific situation, this is the data you, you want to have. 
So it's the, the problem is the it's matching the data with the, the question, with the analytical question. Let me, uh, different questions. So uh, first, the issue of rumors is first we have to understand that traditional media is as sensitive to rumors as any of social media. And uh, I mean, I remember watching the 9-11 the thing happening live and for two hours CNN was saying that a bomb, a car bomb had exploded in front of the Secretary of State of, in Washington. And they were wrong and they just silenced about that. So they erased the fact that they made mistakes of this kind. I mean, this happened the same again at the Boston bombies. It's a normal pattern that traditional media newspapers, they get into rumors, they spread rumors that are false. That's, that are false in factual terms, okay? That's one side. What I think it's an interesting topic of research in these area of rumors is to understand whether the diffusion patterns of factual communications and, ru and, and wrong communications is different from in these networks. Because they may go around certain nodes, for instance. And maybe we have a way to detect patterns of diffusion that so this is more likely to be a rumor, this is less likely to be a rumor because the way it diffuses through the network. Maybe. I don't know if it's true. But it's an interesting topic for us to look at. Uh, and in some way it replicates what happens in society where rumors tend not to pass through some people which are more conscious about fact check. No, no, good question. But going back to the last piece of that, say, I think we should look at social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Tumblr, Reddit, all this, not as uh, of statements of fact, but as a collection of social signals is what people want to say. And they want to say things for different reasons. Okay, in the case, they could, what's interesting when we look at it, I say, well, this means that that data is not reliable. The question is not about accuracy, but whether if there is a constant bias there. Because I think, think about the bird watch. They tend to see more birds to normal. So looking at data, it means not that it's, it's wrong, it means that if you discount the bias, if you measure this bias, you probably can still use that information, but discounting the bias for practical, for practical purposes. This is extremely hard to do well. But in critical situations, you may look and say, that's what I want to go, and then you have to go to kind of small sample interviewing, fact-checking methods to, to understand the, the, where, where your bias is and try to counteract that in, in, the, in the mass structure, the mass, uh, the whole dynamics of the network. But it's very hard. We are, first, we are in the beginning of all this research. And second, this is a moving target. Every day, social media changes and the way people use. Changes not as individual, but as a, as a, as a whole. So whatever you can do now, it's not going to work in one year. That's, that's m our feeling in this arena. But at some point, it gets stable. We hope to be there. This is a terrific session, uh, and I really enjoyed the presentations, but I, I, I'm, I can't bear not to say something. And it has to do with the notion of fact, statement of fact, right? And so we're, I think we're seeing in this discussion two different traditions that go back hundreds of years in terms of thinking about that, right? So from a science point of view, let's take the, the rare bird example, we would say this kind of bird is very rare, statement of fact, right? From a social science humanities point of view, we would say our society now currently believes that this bird is very rare. We would say that humans are currently constructing a reality in which that bird is deemed to be very rare. 
and 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 there's a huge difference, right? So, so uh, you know, from our our side, as uh, social science humanities, we would not believe in objectivity, the truth. Some some, you know, instead we would say that a society, a group, considers something a fact, considers something a fact. If we all, you know, most people agree that, okay. And so then we would, we would say, well, why is that? Well, we would say, okay, well, let's think back in time. You know, we used to all say it was a fact that the sun, you know, revolved around the earth. Or that, you know, molecules always interacted in a particular way. Or that on and on and on, right? So... So it's a very interesting, so, so what people are, in, and I think it, it's interesting, the two presentations, one, one was coming from the notion of theories about human behavior, social network and how, how people and so on, and then looking at the data. The other one was looking at the data and then working backwards, you know, a kind of data discovery, working backwards out of that, yes. you know, and, and it's so interesting because the big data is, is integrating, forcing together conversations mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, theories about human behavior, theories about human thought, and so on, and then going and looking at evidence, we would say. And then the other way around, starting with the data, or what seemed, and then working backwards, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so fascinating, and then to have these discussions in which the vocabularies, the everything, right, is is so, and that's why this moment is so interesting. I think, uh, anyway, I just love these presentations. Uh, and it's, it's gonna be fun, you know, decades ahead to look back on this discussion. <laughs> uh, let me ask uh, some more comments on, on a different topic. Uh, what about human resources to work on this field? Uh, Claudio mentioned uh, at the end of the talk the, 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 this, the, this important topic. And I would like to, to hear from you. How, how can we start doing things in order to prepare people uh, that would be uh, in some five years or 10 years or 15 years able to work uh, on this field? I would like to have some, some ideas. Uh, I think it's two years better. <laughs> no, I, I think the demand is growing. I mean, and, and not social media only. I mean, I think we are generating data at incredible speed. And, uh, and we know we, there is a lot of, of interesting observations that can be t taken from this data. But it's very hard to find professionals in Brazil, outside Brazil, that can handle data properly, okay, and, and more, and even more difficult people that handle that kind of volume of data properly. I mean, and, uh, and so, first thing is make sure that everyone who leaves the computer science course knows probability well, <laughs> and statistics, I think that's a very important skill that even I think in the U.S. they removed that from the core ACM, I believe, Course, yeah, I heard and, uh, some of some course. Basic, basic mathematical, uh, basic, I mean, uh, uh, no, I mean, no, I admire people who who can do statistics well, and uh, I can't. Okay, uh, uh, but there's so much you can do if you do that right, and there's so much wrong stuff you can do if you don't do that well. Okay, you pretended you are seeing things. I mean, I mean, at least they should know that correlation is not causation. That's the first most important thing. But, but statistics is sophisticated. And let me give an example of that. There was a lot of press about this guy that shown that he correlated uh, uh, when after the earthquake in Haiti, they correlated the geographic position of posts and uh, you could find where the most damaged buildings were. 
and said, wow, that's cool. That's a very predictive tool. And now I can lo just look where the tweets uh, and the messages are coming from, and I know where the buildings are. In fact, that was wrong, because he didn't correct his, he didn't do circulation in the context of considering only the places where buildings exist. And when you look and we say, okay, let's correlate this data with only the areas where buildings actually exist, and then it's a negative correlation. People don't tweet on top of piles of rubble, which is also obvious. But So, and this basic statistics, you have to be aware of what you're correlating, what are the distorting factors, and there is take the measures. And data science have need to know that. And uh, it, right now, we don't find that skill. We have guys with statistical background, which have a hard time using the kinds of tools we are talking here. And uh, data si and uh, computer science understand databases, but don't have the. the analytical statistical tools. I mean, not even making the complex where Professor Chad went, of going back to, to the field and compare that with, uh, uh, with uh, qual uh, qualitative work. And even it's more, more rare to find. But I think it's something we need. If you want to move into this era of big data, we need this kind of people. And I think in short term, the issue is giving that more and more of that option to computer science and to statisticians, to people, and then looking into master courses and, and training to, 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 to create this kind of, of, of view from people in the, who have already gone through. Well, I think in the social sciences, looking from Brazil, which is the, the only place I really know about uh, the, the the teaching and the formation of uh, persons in, in the social science, uh, not in two, not in four, not in ten. Uh, I think we are improving, we are really improving, but it will be a very long uh, walk until we have a lot of uh, researchers. Uh, um, I think I we are in phase one of this of this process. Uh, we were ten years ago. We were in phase zero, so it's something. I really think it's something. Uh, yeah, it, it's it was r uh, hard to find uh, social science professors who knew uh, quantitative methods, uh, basically uh, quantitative methods. So. Even uh, selecting new professors to, to teach methods was something very difficult in Brazilian universities. And nowadays you have a, um, a critical mass of persons working on different uh, research fields but uh, who do methods. And I think we are going there, but it will be very hard to get there, to get to, to, to dialogue uh, really with uh, and to analyze uh, big M data in the social science. I have one question. So we know that uh, when we, we, we say the word big data, we are talking about the vo volume of data, the speedness of data, the risk that uh, some data is easily outdated, and so on. So, and but we also know that uh, big data is expensive to, to get. It requires a lot of work. Sometimes data available is not the same. Sometimes, not most uh, times, uh, data available is not the, the, the um, same thing as data that can be treated in order to get inferences and, co and, and, uh, and make analysis and so on. So, uh, what is your opinion about sharing data sets? So, uh, the present situation is that most data sets are, are almost private in Brazil, in the sense that each researcher has its own data set, or each research center has its own data set, so, and we would get a more, a more efficient, efficient use of this data set if we share it. So, 
I suspect you, you will agree that we should uh, share a data set. But if you were to, to, to start sharing data, what would be your priorities if you were to, to be engaged in such an uh, endeavor? Um, <coughs> well, I, I agree with your rhetorical question, and uh, I'm completely in favor of that. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I, I, I also agree that the, the, the large majority of the, the researchers and the centers in Brazil, uh, as we say, sit on the data and on their data and do not uh, uh, exchange data, do not. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, but I'm not sure about the, the answer to, to the last question. Um, I think we, we should have a structure of incentives to make people uh, get the data uh, available. This, um, I think internationally, the, this was done by the, by the reviews, by the journals that uh, uh, obliged people to open the data. This could be something that could be uh, tried in Brazil, that the, the, the journals uh, pushed people to uh, only publish if the researcher uh, uh, presents the data or gives the data to a, a kind of consortium or something like that. But um, there's another possibility, which is to, to try to, to produce or to incentivate uh, exchange of data uh, actively. Uh, I would say that this, uh, the 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 information, uh, I don't know, the the information about uh, uh, s uh, social registers uh, is uh, s something uh, really uh, basic, of uh, kinds of uh, what he was talking about uh, the 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 telephone companies, something that can describe people. And uh, not necessarily about, the, uh, I think data on the connections of people are very, very interesting and important, but the most basic things are about who, who the persons are and where they are and uh, what their attributes are. And uh, we don't know this uh, already. And um, so this could be a start, but I'm just trying to answer you. It's, it's uh, first answer to the question. Do, do you know how, why is there so many research works with Twitter data? And that's basically because you can sample a certain amount of the public stuff for free. And the second is buying large amounts of Twitter data is relatively cheap. I mean, you can buy. I mean, uh, something around. I would say 20 million tweets for public, all public, for no, two, three thousand dollars. Cheap in terms of research. Okay. So that's, uh, and that you cannot do with Facebook. Just, uh, that's an example. And then with other sites, and you can buy from other media. So part of the issue is that. I, I, I think there is a larger issue, and then I, I'm going to really say that this is not, this is my personal, personal view, not my company's view that uh, this land of digital data and words is so new that all our legal system is absolutely obsolete to, to handle it. I mean, I, I, the other day I saw a researcher, I forgot his name now, he said, uh, basically if you look at the way data in social media in particular is controlled at this point. This is the, it's basically pre-Bill of Rights era. The data belongs to the land where you are. So this is before, this is 2013, right, Bill of Rights? So this is before the first, the first uh, legal landmarks in terms of personal rights. So at some point, we as a society, we'll have to discuss what we think is reasonable as the 
data, the, 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 the rights of personal data. And we will have to agree that, and that's a political process. So that's the, the, the basic structure that we'll have to go through at some point. When things are stable, it become a lot, it become a little easier to talk about. It's very hard to do that while the things change as it was going now. Uh, Having said that, I mean, uh, you, you, for instance, sharing becomes difficult. For instance, you can buy uh, tweets from Twitter, but you cannot post a single one of them publicly. You can only talk about aggregated data. That's the rule. Again, someone created, and when you enter to Twitter, it's copyrights theirs, period. They own that data, okay? And that's, again, things that we have to discuss. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking only about Twitter because I, I'm more familiar with it. It's not particularly criticism. I think different areas handle different. And then we have to handle issue, the issue of uh, personal data, private things that I want to be private. It's a, it's a very complicated structure. In some ways that we will have to, f to look into models like which the the, the, the medical profession has done in terms of data and, and the codes of conduct. I mean, the, it's not trivial to, to do, but all of this have to be done in the context of a really rethinking of our legal structure around this. What, what are, what's a reasonable agreement with a data collector like uh, Twitter, Facebook, or whatever? I mean, right now, it's everything belongs to them. It's basically. There's a, well, and no, that's the normal. And they also have legitimate issues to say why they want to do that because they, want to have to, they also have to be protected in some ways from people saying that they're abusing. There's all this collection. So very complicated. In this case, it's very complicated. Uh, but we should try to work together, maybe consortiums of in the, these companies that provide access to the data under certain conditions, of course, respecting privacy and so on. So we can advance this this kind of, of study. Thank you, Eduardo Marquez and Claudio Pianis for so interesting contributions to our current and very Young, young, young debate on digital humanities in uh, in uh, Brazil. We are now ha now have a, a coffee break, a thirty minutes uh, coffee break, and the next uh, two sessions will start at four p.m. in these two uh, rooms. Thanks a lot for attending this session. <laughs>